Um, I suppose my, my link to the Turing Institute is because I do statistics. And also, I have a bright uh, student here me who is sitting in the audience. And I hope I, I would be able to speak some of the things we are working on next time. Okay. So really, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what I have been working on uh, recently. So, um, so really, my research interest is about uh, developing statistical methodology uh, for analyzing data. And I usually develop uh, some not so efficient algorithms, but I, I would always like to have some theoretical guarantees uh, for the methods I develop. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, three recent projects uh, I worked on. And uh, uh, these reports are, uh, are on archive, and you can download them. And the first project is about uh, a distributed computational method for analyzing high dimensional data. This is something Kerala has eluded to. Actually, you have a high dimensional problem in which your features are highly correlated. And how do you break down the correlation barrier such that you can do parallel computing I guess, to speed up uh, the, the, the estimation process? Okay. The second piece of research I'm going to talk about is about the theoretical tractable model for analyzing social networks. And in particular, I'm going to talk about how to do, how, how, how can one think about uh, quantifying uncertainties in the estimated parameters. And this will be motivated by a very simple social network example. And finally, I'm going to talk about, this is uh, the, the, the third piece of research is completely open, by the way. Uh, finally, I'm going to talk about a new statistical procedure for detecting multiple inferential points, also known as uh, a normally detection in engineering when you have a high dimensional space. Okay? And by the way, uh, in all the three pieces of, uh, of, of research, the factors that, that are big, for example, in the first piece of research, the dimensionality is very high, such that you can't possibly even fit your data into a single computer to do your regularized regression. Okay? And for the second, piece of research, the number of nodes can diverge to infinity such that it creates some difficulty when it comes to statistical inference when you want to quantify the uncertainty in the estimated parameters. Okay, I will come back to that later. And finally, for detecting multiple inferential points, actually, even in low dimensional spaces, it is an open problem how to identify multiple, multiple inferential points. Uh, in a theoretically justified way. I will, I will, I will talk a bit, little bit about that as well. Okay? So I'm going to start by talking about a distributed computational method by looking at, as you may have uh, guessed it, the simplest linear regression model where you want to relate a response variable to a high dimensional uh, feature uh, 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 vector. And if you have m observations, I can write my model simply as y equals to x times beta plus some random error. And where I only observe the data pair uh, x and y. Okay? Now the interest here is obviously to estimate this beta as accurately as possible. Okay? And as I mentioned, there are certain features in the data that are very high. And in particular, in my case, uh, we have a huge number of features in the sense that the number of columns in this X matrix is huge. And if that happens, as we know, we can't even do ordinary least squares, right? So some kind of a sparse regression, as Carola ha has talked about, can be helpful. And I will, I will talk about that later. Okay? Now, the particular problem I want to look at is the situation where the number of features is so large that you don't want to fit your data into a single computer. Now, uh, now, here is a simple idea. If you can't fit your data into a single computer, what you can do is to break down your data set and uh, distribute them to, onto different uh, you know, computers, right? And uh, do separate fitting <coughs> on each computer, and uh, in the end, aggregate your estimates somehow. Okay? Now, this turns out, uh, it turns out that this is a very simple idea. You have a fat data where you have a huge number of features, as I said, right? Now what you can do is to break down the features by partitioning your data matrix X column-wise, right? So what I can do is I can have small pieces of the data set, and then I distribute each piece onto each computer. And in the end, right, I have one estimate from each computer, and I have some way to, to aggregate, 
aggregate my estimates. Now it turns out if you have a huge number of features, well the features are highly correlated, it doesn't work always as I will illustrate by, by looking at one simple example. Okay? So let's look at it, uh, uh, one simple example where you don't have so many features. Let's suppose you have a fixed number of features, that is your P is relatively small. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a simple column splitting in the following sense. I have my x, x matrix. What I'm going to do is to divide my data into two parts by dividing the columns. Okay? Now I have x1 and x2. Okay? For notational purposes, I'm going to partition my beta uh, correspondingly okay? for derivation purposes. Okay? So what I'm going to do next is to distribute my data onto two machines. Okay? I have my y vector, right, which is n by 1, and I have my x1 matrix. I'm going to distribute this part of the data to machine 1, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, distribute the other, other data to, to machine 2. And I will see what happens. Okay? Now let's look at the data set on machine 1 and see what we can do. Okay? Let's suppose we do the simplest, the ordinary least squares <coughs> estimation. And uh, the formula is standard, right? We have x transpose x inverse times x transpose y. This is the least squares estimator for the data on machine one, right? So I want to see what happens to my estimator by computing the expected value of the estimator, right? So this is very simple. I compute the expectation of it and see what happens, okay? So if I, I can somehow stuck in the true model, which is written as x1 beta 1 plus x2 beta 2 plus epsilon, right? This is the, the part from my true model, right? I can compute the expectation such that the expectation of my ordinary least squares estimator can be written as the summation of the true parameter, some term here, and the third term whose expectation is zero. Okay? It turns out it's very easy to see that the expectation of the estimator does not equal to the true parameter I want to estimate until x1 and x2 are orthogonal to each other. Right? So the, the, the point here is that if you have correlated features by simply partitioning your features, okay, you are not going to get unbiased estimator right, for the subvector here, beta 1. Okay? Now the same thing can be said about the estimation of a beta 2. Okay? So what do you do? Right? So this motivates the first piece of research that if I can somehow find x1 and x2 that are orthogonal to each other, actually I can use this simple scheme. Right? I can partition my, my features if they are orthogonal to each other, such that the resulting estimator would be unbiased according to my derivation, my simple derivation here. Okay? So that's exactly what motivated the first piece of research. So what we are going to do here is to, to find some matrix, let's call it Q, which is M by M. I have M, co uh, sorry, I have M data points, right? So what I'm going to do is to pre-multiply my data by this Q matrix such that the resulting X matrix would be an orthogonal matrix, okay? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pre-multiply my Y by this Q and pre-multiply my X by this Q in the hope that my x, my new x matrix, which is denoted as x tilde, would be an orthogonal matrix in the following sense. x tilde transpose x tilde would be an identity matrix. If that's the case, right, then I, by distributing my features onto different machines, right, I can get unbiased estimator on each machine. And I can divide, as, I can divide my data to as many machines as I like, actually, right? Okay, so this is a simple motivation for this approach. Okay? So the research question is how to find this Q matrix. Right? <coughs> okay? Now, of course, again, Carola has uh, talked about this. Uh, so when you, when, when you have a data set where the number of features is huge, now, of course, you can't do ordinary least squares, right? So you have to use some regularized uh, estimation procedure, and in our particular case, we are going to use an L1 uh, uh, penalty-based uh, 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 objective function to find our, 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 our parameters. Okay? So this is the, the, the penalized least squares criterion with a penalty 
to encourage the sparseness of the resulting estimator, right? So I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about it, okay? So the pseudo algorithm would work like this, okay? So the first step is to find some Q matrix, and then I trans transform my data as X tilde and the Y tilde, right? And then I can partition my data, right? My, I can partition my X matrix, right? Uh, uh, into M subsets, and then I can distribute my X tilde J and the Y tilde onto different machines, okay? Now on each machine, I can have my sparse, as, uh, uh, sparse estimator for each beta J here. I denote it as beta J hat, and in the end, I aggregate the estimators from these machines, right? By having my final estimator beta hat, Okay, which is written this way. So it's very simple, right? I break down my problem into pieces. Now, on each machine, I have some estimator of a sub-vector of a beta, right? And in the end, I, I, I combine them, okay? So very simple. Now, question, of course, is, to, is how to find this Q matrix. Okay, so this is the research bit of, of the project. So I'm going to make two claims. When you have more data points than features, I claim that there exists some Q matrix, which is n by n, such that x tilde transpose times x tilde is an identity matrix. Okay, I will, I will show a few slides uh, very soon. And when n is smaller than p, this is mo the more interesting case where you have more features than your 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 observations, right? You have more columns than you have more columns than rows, right? Okay. I'm going to claim that there exists some Q matrix, again, of dimension n by m, such that the product here is close to an identity matrix. Now, by the way, you can never find m, sorry, you can never find m, n by n matrix Q, such that this would be an identity, right? Because, simply because you have more columns than rows here. So this cannot be, right, the case. Uh, uh, so what we can do is to make the product to be close to an identity matrix, okay? So let's look at the low dimensional case where M is larger than P. You have more rows than columns for your X matrix, okay? So what we can do is do a single, is, is, is to do a simple singular value decomposition, right? I, have, I can write my X matrix as U times D times V transpose where the columns of U are orthogonal to each other, and this V is an orthonormal matrix. Okay. Now I can find my Q matrix. I can, I can, I can define my Q matrix this way. Okay. And then I pre-multiply my X and the Y by this Q matrix. Okay. And my new model becomes Y tilde equals to X tilde times beta plus some random noise. Right. Okay. It's straightforward to check them. X tilde transpose times X tilde is an identity matrix. It's very simple. Okay. So if M is larger than P, I can find this Q matrix such that X tilde transpose times X tilde is an identity. So the columns are, orth are orthogonal to each other. So I can use my, my simple trick I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Okay. Now, when P is larger than N, as I said, this is the more interesting case, right? You have more features than, than variables. Okay, so what you can do is, again, you can do a singular value decomposition, okay? Again, you have UGV, okay? Where U is an orthonormal matrix. The columns, sorry, the rows of this V are orthogonal to each other. Now, again, I'm going to take the same Q matrix defined exactly the same as in the last slides. And then we can easily see that X tilde transpose times X tilde equals to V times V transpose. And as I said, this is not going to be an identity matrix, right? Okay. I can only say V transpose times V equals to an identity matrix, but not, not for, for this product. Okay. Now the research bit uh, of, of, of this is that we can show actually the largest off-diagonal term of this matrix divided by the minimum diagonal term of this matrix is actually bounded with high probability by this 
This is the square root of log p divided by m. So if you imagine that if log p divided by m, divided by m is small o1, it basically says that we have a diagonally dominate matrix in the sense that the diagonals are much larger than the off diagonals. And this is exactly the regime we are interested in. The dimension can be sub -expan exponentially high relative to the sample size. And for this regime, our pr proposed method would work. Okay. Okay. Now, by the way, at this moment, you might wonder, well, you want to do distributed computing, but you know, your method, in your method, you will have to compute the singular value decomposition for um, n by p matrix that's computationally intensive. It turns out that if you look at the form of this Q matrix, actually you don't have to compute the singular value decomposition of x, but instead you just have to compute the singular value decomposition of x times x transpose, which is um, n by n matrix. Now, again, in the problem I'm interested in, where p is much la larger than n, this can be easily handled, actually. Right? So this is not a problem. Right? And then we can even use parallel computing techniques to compute the product of these two matrices. Right? So this can be easily done. Okay? So this is ex exactly what uh, uh, this approach is, is all about. So the research a bit here, as I said, I, I always like to have some theoretical guarantees about our developed approach. Now, you can imagine that, well, in terms of developing any theory, what we would like to have is that the resulting estimator from this approach would behave more or less the same as the estimator if you were to fit your whole data set on a single computer. And we can show that, indeed, this is the case for this estimator. And the second theoretical result we have is about how well our approach is able, to is able to estimate the true support of a beta. And it turns out that actually, if you can do this decorrelating step by pre-multiplying x and y by this Q matrix, actually, this approach would be able to identify the, the true sparse model, if there is one, of course, right, with some theoretical guarantee, actually, and with few assumptions compared, compared to the literature where stringent assumptions are usually needed. Okay? And finally, it, this approach enjoys very nice computational properties. Right? Okay? You can easily use some parallel computing algorithm to, 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 to uh, conduct the singular value decomposition of x transpose x. Right? And then you just split your, your, your features onto different machines. Right? And on each machine, you do, you do your regularized estimation. And in the end, you just combine the estimates. Right? So it's very highly parallelizable in that sense. Okay? Right? So any, any question? Right? So, yeah. so now, now I'm going to talk about the second piece of research uh, we have been working on. This is about a, a tractable model for social networks. Okay? So let me start by, by giving you a motivating example. Okay. Now, this is not a, a big data set, by the way. It's a historical, historic data set where you only have 71 nodes uh, for this social network. So this data set is taken from the Zaga 2001, where they looked at the 71 lawyers. Now, basically, they handed out a, a, a questionnaire asking these 71 lawyers who they would like to socialize with after work. Okay? So this is the, the context. Okay? So, so you, can, you can actually plot uh, the, you know, the, the, the connections by, by, by using some graph. Right? So here is one. So I have 71 nodes. Now, you have a directed node from this. Uh, you have a directed edge from node i to j. If node i identifies node j as, as, as his or her friend. Okay, so you have a directed uh, edge. Okay. Now, of course, for social networks of this sort, very naturally, you would have other nodal information as well. For example, for, example, for this particular data set, for each lawyer, they have collected 
For example, the formal status of the lawyer, the practice of the lawyer, the age, the sex of the lawyer, and etc. In total, you have you have seven covariates. Okay. So on the left hand side here, because we have a directed network here, you might think that uh, probably the feelings are mutual in the sense that if if uh, if a lawyer have uh, ha have you know for example five incoming connections, he or she would have five outcoming connections as well. But it turns out that this is not the case. If you look at uh, some of the nodes here, I have plotted the size sizes of the nodes by their degrees. And on the left hand, hand side, I plotted them by their in degrees. And on the right hand side, I plotted the, the, the sizes of the nodes by their out degrees. As you can see here, the sizes are quite different. For example, if you look at this particular lawyer, they are different. And also, I color coded the nodes by examining their, for example, formal status or practice. As you can see here, you can see some kind of a clustering effects you know, on both plots, meaning that this covariance might be useful for describing how these lawyers were connected in some sense. Okay, so putting this all together, we would like to model you know, the connection probability by using some function which depends on, for example, two nodal uh, 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 parameters one is about you know, how attractive the node is. The other is about how active the node is to socialize. Okay? And since we have, have a covariance also where we would like to characterize that by, by using some, some covariance information in the model. So taking together the probability of node i making a co connection to node j depends on you know, how attractive the node is how active the node is to socialize and uh, the seven dimensional covariates. Okay? Now for, dimension, uh, for simplicity, we're going to assume that uh, all the connections are independent so that uh, we, can, we can develop uh, some maximum likelihood estimation method uh, for, for, for estimating the parameters. Okay? So there are many questions you can ask. Okay? So what properties the resulting maximum likelihood estimates would have when the number of the total, the total number of the lawyers goes to infinity. And you would also like to ask, for example, whether the incomingness and uh, the outgoingness are the same, such that you don't need this many parameters. By the way, for the incomingness and the outgoingness parameters, you need 71 times 2 parameters, right? And then you have 7 parameters for the covariates. So here I will just quickly show you the result. So this is the, the final result. As I said, you have maximum likelihood estimates for the, for the, for the covariates, and we have seven of them. But, but it turns out that the fact that you have two, diverging set, uh, two sets of diverging dimensional, dimensional parameters and a fixed dimensional parameter in your model makes the inference very difficult, you, and you have to adjust that. Okay, so these these are the adjusted uh, parameter estimates, and these are the are the standard deviations of, of, of these estimated parameters. And indeed, if you look at, at uh, the p-values, it turns out that the two covariates we looked at in the previous slides are indeed significant, and in particular. Uh, the status parameter and the practice parameter are both highly significant. And also, the estimated parameters are both positive, indicating that they are, they are more likely to make connections if they share similar practices or, or similar status. Okay? I think I will, I will stop here just by saying that, uh, uh, by saying that, uh, um, well, these are exciting times to, to, do, to do data science, and there are many open problems to work on, and I look forward uh, to collaborating with, with fellow fellows. Okay, thank you.